Hey listeners, did you know that Yogi Triathlete offers endurance coaching for body and mind? We offer personalized training plans for endurance sports, wellness and mindset, nutrition and recovery guidance, and race preparation and strategy, all within the supportive community of Team Yogi Triathlete. So if you're ready to conquer your fitness goals and push your limits, our endurance coaches are ready to guide you on the journey to peak performance. Go to yogitriathlete.com today to set up your free 30-minute discovery call and embrace a future of strength, stamina, and achievement. Your goals, our experience, the perfect match for unstoppable success. I'm excited to take on that challenge and more than anything, keep the athlete at the center of, of the focus, you know? I think sometimes when you go into elite sports and, and sometimes that can get lost and and it is tricky, of course, people, you know, governing, sports governing bodies want results. Um, they're very results driven, but behind results are, are, are humans. They're <laughs> human being athletes, you know, and I think we need to think creatively, think broadly, and also know that like a development pathway is not singular. It's not a one step process. Um, this might look different for everybody. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the challenge, but that's also what's interesting. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 407 of the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. We are your hosts, Jess and BJ, and we're so happy to welcome Belgian professional triathlete Claire Michelle back to the show. Claire first launched into the Yogi Triathlete community in 2018, and in that episode, we go into detail about her backstory and much about her resilient mindset. Since then, we've remained addicted to world triathlon draft legal racing and have continued to follow Claire's career in this realm. As she now pursues her third Olympic Games in Paris this summer, it felt like the perfect time to invite her back onto the show to catch up, dive in, and give space for Claire to share her athletic wisdom with us as she did back in episode 116. Inspired to be an Olympian at the age of 12, after finding newspaper clippings about her mom's debut in the 1976 Olympics, Claire first focused on swimming, then running, and it wasn't until 2012 when Claire started competing in triathlon that she found multisport to be the ticket to fulfilling her Olympic dreams. In 2015, she stepped into her professional multi-sport career, which has afforded her experiences of high highs and low lows. But through it all, Claire has stood the test of time. Thank you so much for tuning in today, for supporting the show. We've really been looking forward to this conversation. So Claire Michelle, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. It's good to be back on five years later. I know. I know. <laughs> Where's the time gone? <laughs> You were one of the ones uh, that we had podcasted with uh, in person. So you actually got to come to our little studio when you guys were training in in Carlsbad, which is uh, quite a far distance from where you are today. So where are are you today? Today I am in Montegordo, Portugal. So this is kind of where the squad that was once based in Southern California has now moved to be primarily European-based. So we spend the winter, let's say December until more or less May uh, here in Monte Gordo. So this is really in the south, in the Algarve, a um, little corner of Portugal. And uh, then we tend to go to Font-Romeu on altitude in the middle of the season and typically close out the season in Banyoles in, um, or Girona in Spain. So mm-hmm. that's kind of how we've structured. But of course, with comings and goings to, to all, the, you know, following the World Triathlon Series, championship calendar, um, and all the places that that takes us. What is it about Girona? It seems to be like the hot ticket, or maybe that's just our perspective as we see everybody gravitating there. Is it because Jan is living there or (laughs) why is Girona so special? What what does it mean? Yeah. I mean, well, we are technically usually, um, more based in Banyoles, which is like 30 minutes away. Um, that's where there's a lake there. Um, it's only a 25 meter pool though, but there is the, this lake with a 500 meter lane, which is impressive. Um, (laughs) so that's, that's a really cool tool for us to use. Um, and I, I think you have access to, you know, quiet riding and and running is also fine there, but yeah, Girona, I can understand the appeal. It has, uh, let's say a little bit more of the 
trendy coffee shops and the <laughs> bike culture and all this stuff, which is which is cool, which is fun. But I have to say that personally, I prefer I prefer Banyolas. Where is Banyolas? Is that in Spain as well? It's in Spain as well. It's just thirty minutes uh, from oh, right. thirty minute drive, more or less from from Girona. So right, right, but right. We we do have some members of the squad, um, like American Seth Ryder and Taylor Spivey, that have uh, apartments there. So they kind of really base themselves there a bit more um, throughout the year. And where you are in Portugal looks beautiful. Uh, I, I know some friends that are actually going to be hosting a yoga retreat there in the spring, and it just it looks warm and gorgeous. And so is it typically like tempid climate there? Is it, is it nice and warm right now this time of year or do you, are you guys experiencing a winter? Um, I don't think we could call this really a difficult winter. (laughs) Um, (laughs) you know, I think we were there for five months last year and we had about five days of rain. Um, in within that five month span. So we really, really can't complain. Usually when it does rain, it's also not, uh, super long or, you know, it, it's, it's very mild. I would say most, it can be a bit chilly in the morning, uh, but it gets up to, you know, 15, 20 degrees Celsius in the afternoon. So that would be, you know, around seventies Fahrenheit. So very pleasant. Um, yeah, a bit like Southern California, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it looks beautiful. Um, I didn't know that was uh, where you were right now um, in Portugal. So we have caught wind of um, an announcement you just made about stepping into a coaching role at the end of the season. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I did make the decision that this was going to be my last professional year, um, and I. Ultimately, what happened in May at the end of last year, a position opened up, which is not—it's not actually technically a coaching role. This is—it um, was a technical director position, and so this position is essentially um, like a managing director, if you will, of Belgium Triathlon. And in Belgium, we have the particularity that we have two federations. So there's a French-speaking federation and a Flemish-speaking federation, and so. <laughs> It's just the way our country is set up, but um, but I will be in charge of the French speaking half, and uh, that job will start. So yeah, I, as I said, I solicited in um, May of last year, went through the whole um, interview process, and then in the end was selected for the position. But obviously, they knew I had still big goals with uh, Paris in 2024, so I wasn't available to start right away. But I was available to start as as of. January basically next year. So um, there is an interim technical director who will then um, become kind of like an, uh, an assistant uh, manager for me next year, which is great because um, it's a pretty small federation compared to if I think of the US Federation or British Federation or some of these other countries that have a really big triathlon history. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really a situation of, of stepping into something that's kind of an entrepreneurial project, I would say. You're really building things from the ground up. It's a lot of grassroots work that needs to be done with the clubs, with the coaches, um, developing young athletes and kind of creating these pathways into elite sports. And that's ultimately what, you know, something that really matched with my core values and and it aligned well with, with my beliefs and my belief also that sport can be quite transformative in a person's life. So, um, yeah, that's ultimately what led me to to apply, and uh, I'm excited to take on that challenge, even though I think it's going to be a, a good challenge, <laughs> but I'm excited to take it on starting next year, and and more than anything, keep the athlete at the center of, of the focus, you know? Um, I think sometimes when you go into elite sports, and, and sometimes that can get lost, and, and it is tricky. Of course, people, you know, governing sports governing bodies want results um they're very results driven but behind results are 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 humans they're (laughs) human being athletes you know and i think we need to think creatively think broadly and also know that like a development pathway is not singular it's not a, a you know a one step process um this might look different for everybody so um yeah, I mean that's 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 the challenge, but that's also what's interesting. What does it feel like to um, to have the experience as an athlete 
um, from the perspective that you've, you've experienced over the past eight to 12 years? And then how does that relate to what you can bring to this position? Like, do you have some insight and intel into how things can yeah, be Yeah, that's, that's an interesting, <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting question because, you know, if I'm being completely honest, I mean, and I think I can say this fairly since I'm in an international squad, but almost all athletes kind of have beef with their federation. It's like, <laughs> they're like the dark side, you know, <laughs> but, um, and, and that's because they're responsible sport at an elite level is a zero sum game. So, you know, you, at some point you have to make criteria, you have to make, let's say selection policy that's going to cut out some and include others. And that's results-based. And I can definitely understand that that's emotional and that's a hard thing to do. And it's hard to create also, especially in triathlon, you know, times don't really matter. This is not like where you have a group of swimmers and you say, okay, you know, the one that hit this, this time can go. And if you didn't hit this time, you can't go. No, I mean, the dynamics of especially short course where it being draft legal um, you know, you have maybe a weaker swimmer or somebody with like my profile, for example, that's a bit of a weaker swimmer. If I swim 10 seconds faster or 10 seconds slower, that can totally change the outcome of my race. It can change whether or not I catch a certain bike group or can, you know, make it a bridge up to the front pack or not. And, you know, that's, that's true for all athletes. Cause it's, it's just the dynamics of the race play a huge role in the outcome. So, you know, it's, it's about thinking how to create, um, yeah, I think you have to just really understand the dynamics of the sport and how triathlon plays out in order to make good selection policy and good criteria. And that being said, I think it's still hard. (laughs) I think it's still hard because, you know, there's always going to be kind of people caught out. I think we saw, you know, there are examples of this that we see with Olympic selection and so forth in certain countries where it's really dense. I think the U S women is a, is a great example of, oof, that is a hard, hard team to select and to make good criteria to select. But, you know, I've always kind of been of the belief that you can complain about things or you can try to work towards solutions. And I'm all really try to be a solution oriented person. Um, and you know, that's, that's also what kind of, um, yeah, like I said, again, drove me to ultimately apply is, is that I hope I can bring some of that firsthand athlete perspective and bring some of that, um, let's say on, you know, on the race course experience to, to, to developing criteria, to developing structure and pathways, um, of development that target, (laughs) <laughs> what you actually need to develop as an athlete. So um, that's what I hope to bring to the table. So what will your role be? Um, and I know you, like you said, it's kind of an, it's an entrepreneurial role, but can, what will your role be in this selection process? Is it, is it kind of the organization on the team um, level or are you actually a part of this selection process? Are you, I guess what I'm saying is, are you positioning the athletes in a way where, you know, they're set up to be, uh, have their best chance, you know, um, or are you actually in that selection process? Yeah, I'm much more on the management side of things than the coaching side of things. So I would say that there's kind of two main buckets that I would be responsible for. And One is the development side of things like junior through elite. So creating that selection policy and creating the funding structure that goes along with that. So at a lower level, that might be, for example, organization of community days where you invite all the local clubs to come and maybe do like kind of a, you know, 400 meter swim test and a 3K run test, just so you have an idea kind of of where people are. And then you can kind of maybe based on these performance standards or based on race results is another option is invite people to training camps where you bring people together and you try to, or even training weekends in Belgium um, that might be targeted at developing certain skills. And the other bucket I would say is also on coaching development and club development. So creating clubs and helping coaches also develop their skills 
Because right now, to be completely honest, <laughs> it's often a lot of times just people's parents, like, you know, like a, like a little league softball dad uh, would be the equivalent in the U.S. of just like, hey, can, can you coach this club's swim session or whatever? And, you know, there's, there's, it's just not, let's say, very professionalized. There's not necessarily enough funding or enough money in it. Uh, you know, clubs maybe can only offer one or two training sessions uh, a week, um, you know, so, so it's about really helping professionalize, let's say the whole structural side of things from a club level, from a coach level, and then also helping provide these pathways for those that are kind of, I don't really like the word talent, but I guess you could call it talent detection. Um, you know, and just for those that are a bit more committed, a bit more that are standing out above the rest, give them a pathway of like, okay, how do you move for instance, from, you know, a regional level to a Belgian championship level to, okay, now let's move to continental cups, to world cups, to world series. How does that flow? How do you progress through that? Um, and, uh, obviously all of this, also the, the last aspect is in collaboration with the Flemish speaking equivalent of (laughs) on the, on the Northern half of, of, uh, Belgium. So, uh, there is also collaboration, of course, with them because we we represent Belgium at the end of the day. So the criteria, especially on an international level, needs to match. So yeah, it's a bit complex, but that's about that's about it. Yeah, but what an incredible opportunity! Yeah. Like it, it sounds to me that you're stepping into a role where you have an opportunity to take like Belgian triathlon to the next level and the, the next level of, of competitive skill really to the world stage of the Olympics? Well, I hope so. Um, I yeah. think, I think <laughs> that would be great. I mean, yeah, the, the, the biggest thing is, you know, trying to hopefully get the next, the future generation, um, you know, to come through and, and I think there's a lot of talent here in Belgium, but I, and, and again, I, I don't really like that word because sometimes talent implies that it's just something innate that people have, but I just really don't believe that. I just think that you cultivate these things, you develop these things, you nurture these things, you help them grow. And, um, you know, I, I, so I just think there's, a, there's a lot of possibility. I think there's a lot of, um, yeah, I, for lack of a better word, let's say this talent that kind of gets lost along the way, just because it falls through the cracks of the system. It falls through, you know, and, and in Belgium, there's not like this U S system also at a university level where you can go on and do university level mm. sports. Those are very separate things. So you know, around the age of 18, a lot of athletes and 18 is so young (laughs) and, you know, and and there's, especially for triathlon, this is not gymnastics, but it's like, you know, at 18, they're like, well, I guess I got to make a choice. I guess I'll study because, you know, I I don't know if I'll ever be able to make a living at this triathlon thing. And, and then they're gone and you lose those years from like 18 to 22, 23. And it's like, oh, there is, there is the possibility to combine, uh, but if we need to work on like work with universities, work through the logistics, um, work through offering kind of this, the, the help, um, on the side so that people are able to combine both. I'm not saying it's easy, but I think that there are solutions. Yeah. Yeah. You're kind of, you're in this and I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos of people's channels of people trying to make it, let's just say in the professional mm-hmm. world, but they have the skill set, but they don't have the resources to actually fulfill that. Maybe they do for a year and they become a YouTuber and they're able to make some money. But then it's like, well, what happens after they don't win the big prize? Because so much is emphasized on the, the top, top, top. And then they fall out of it and they can't even, they can't even make a living doing what they, they want to do. So you're kind of in this space of identifying talent, let's use that word, or people that are, you know, passionate about pursuing this, but also like where the resources that provide them the, the years from 18 to 22 that can, that can sustain them for a bit until they can get on their own feet, get some sponsorship dollars, whatever that looks like, and then be able to launch a, a magnificent career in the sport of triathlon where they're probably competing against other sports as well. And I'm sure in Belgium, I would have to think cycling is competing with, mm-hmm. with a little bit of this and, and I'm not sure what else, but 
um, I feel like there's that gap that you're talking about, which is a very <laughs> important point in time where they can either take the trajectory to greatness or not greatness, but yeah, I guess greatness in, in the sport of triathlon. Or they're like, well, what else am I supposed to do now? Like I need to pay the bills. Mm. Yeah. I think that's a really difficult moment um, for a lot of athletes that step between, um, you know, you, you're not quite a professional yet, but you're kind of on the cusp. <laughs> so you're, you're probably either studying or working full time and you know, it's not sustainable probably from a financial and a <laughs> stress and a, <laughs> um, just, I don't know, physical even perspective in terms of, of, you know, just trying to balance everything and get the training in. And yet, you know, at one point you kind of have to make the jump. And usually it, it's like, a you give you, you give yourself a year and it's, you know, when we talked five years ago in Carlsbad, I had just completed that. I would say mm -hmm. when I took the decision to join the squad, I was like, I just did a straight up cost benefit analysis. I was like, okay, this is what I got in the bank. I just quit my job. This is what, how much I have saved up. Um, I don't have a professional contract, but, you know, and I kind of said to my coach Paulo at the time, I said, listen, like I need to earn this much money. This is what it looks like in terms of results. <laughs> Either we get there in this year or we don't. And if we don't, then I need to make some other choices, you know, and, and that's scary because it puts a lot of pressure on it. Um, you know, and in the end it, it did work out which is good, but you have to bet on yourself and it kind of have to be a bit, um, gutsy to do that. And yeah, it's, uh, but I think it's something that really a lot of athletes, um, kind of juggle with. And, and I was, will say also in the beginning, it's, it's also a little bit like progressive. I went from working full time to four fifths to part time, And then, you know, negotiating with my boss, like, oh, okay, can I come in an hour late every day and leave an hour early every day <laughs> and then work a half day from home on Saturday just so that I could have, you know, a, a training morning, a training session in the morning and a training session in the evening. And, you know, it sounds silly, but like those two hours, that shift, I was doing the same work, but the shift in the logistics of it totally changed how I could organize, how much training I could do in a week. And that's also probably what a lot of these, you know, students need as well. Uh, just a little bit of flexibility from, from a school system, from teachers, probably a lot of understanding from parents as well to just be able to, you know, organize themselves. It's not about doing less. It's just about combining it in a way that, that can make it sustainable and can make it doable. And, but that's not, I mean, that's easy to say, but <laughs> it's not easy to do. Yeah. And you have to stay in that solution focused mindset, which you were, right? So now you're going to take this into, into your, your next career or your next level of career in triathlon, but you were living it and doing it yourself. So it's, It's not like you're moving into this saying, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm going to work on solution oriented, um, you know, skills and, and bringing that to Belgian triathlon. Like you've lived this, it's in your bones. And, um, I guess my, my question is, and we've, maybe you've answered it already, but will you be like right up in, in the faces of these athletes or is it more from, you know, uh, up above like a management position or will you be right there where you can talk to these athletes about, you know, this kind of solution mindset moving forward? What, what can they do, um, you know, to amend their work schedule to start pursuing triathlon on this next level? Yeah. I mean, I hope to really be an on the ground, uh, kind of technical director. Uh, I had the chance to come here just a little bit early to Monte Gordo this year because the youth, the French speaking Belgian youth were doing a training camp here for a week. And so I was able to join them for three or four days. So, you know, that for me is always, well, first of all, it was, it was just super exciting to see how motivated and enthusiastic <laughs> these like 15, 16 year olds were. That is just super contagious. Uh, you can just tell that they just, just love it. You know, they just love it. And, um, so that's, that's really cool. Um, but yeah, to, to be able to ride with them, to go running with them, uh, you know, I went to the pool with them. We would 
share meals together. Uh, I put together a trivia game for them. Um, you know, but it's like I say, it's, it's a small community. So yeah, my hope is to really be like, yeah, somebody who's on the field. Um, I don't know if, if that's the right terminology, but, um, you know, the, these, I think that everybody's people come to triathlon from all kinds of backgrounds. So I think that's a really important thing also to take into consideration. Um, and I, I think, as you said, also Vija, the cycling culture in Belgium is an interesting aspect because I don't think that many other countries actually have, most people have ex swimmers or ex runners mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. that kind of come to triathlon. We actually have a decent amount of ex cyclists, which is an interesting thing because kids grow up doing cyclocross and mountain bike and, and road cycling. And the culture is just really big with that. So I just think it's going to be a, a really, you know, when you're looking to develop someone, you just have to take a personalized, individualized approach. At least that's my belief. And I don't think this is like a top down one size fits all. No, this is like, talk to the athlete, find out what they need. And the athlete should always, always, always be the center of the project and the one leading it to a certain extent. I, I think my role, the way I see it is more guiding and facilitating and helping find solutions that they're, they're essentially asking for, you know? So, um, and I think that's just going to look very individualized. Yeah. It's really, it's so cool. You know, I, I revisited our podcast yesterday um, and we were talking about ca your career. I don't know why we were talking about this back then, but we were talking about, I think it was uh, spawned from your dad. Like, you know, well, what are you going to do after you're, you're a professional triathlete? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we were just to sum it up, we were, you were basically saying like, I'm going to be okay. Like I'm going to find my way. Like there's going to be something for me. And so here you are, right? Like stepping into yeah. kind of an ideal situation for you. Exciting. It's, it's new. It's, you know, it's going to be a lot of work, but there's a lot of possibility. Um, but before that happens, you are going for your third Olympics in Paris. So let's, <laughs> let's bring it back to you as a professional triathlete. How does like an Olympic year inform training and racing? Is it racing more? Is it racing less? Like is training, you know, it, does training kind of stay the same? What does it look like going into an Olympic year? So yeah, the, the buildup into an Olympic year is usually kind of broken down into two parts. And the first uh, is the qualification, which officially ends May 27th. Okay. So before Tokyo, for example, well, Tokyo was a bit special, obviously it's COVID, but before mm -hmm. Tokyo, I had already hit my qualification standards um, for Belgium like a year before. So that was, I had hit the automatic standards. So that was really good. In this case, I have not. So I have done one half of the criteria. So one part of that was hit when I did a top 12 at the grand final in Pontevedra this last September. And, um, what I would need to do to secure it officially is another top eight at any of the world series before May 27th. So that would be Abu Dhabi coming up, uh, first week of March, Yokohama, uh, world series or Cagliari world series. Those are the three that are left. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's sprint or Olympic distance for us. It's like any world series that sprint or Olympic, uh, so that's, that's kind of the first part. So I plan to take advantage of all three of those opportunities, uh, those racing opportunities, but those will be my main focus. So I'll probably won't race that much. There's, um, yeah, there's no racing really at that level. There's no, I mean, there are world cups, but I, yeah, my focus is really on qualifying. That's the first step. And then, um, actually there's only one world series left before the games and that's Hamburg. And that's about two weeks before, um, so, uh, right now that's actually the only thing I really have on my race program. Uh, there is a, a European cup that's here in Portugal, like 30 minutes away from where we are at Quartera, uh, that is in April. So I was thinking, oh, maybe I will do that one just as a tune up, but I think a lot of the squad mates are doing it. So that's about it. But you know, the, I think the key with the preparation for any Olympics is, <laughs> stick to what, you know, <laughs> um, you know, focus on once you get your qualification in, then 
you know, just, just keep, stay injury free, stay consistent. And, uh, and there's no need, like rarely does doing something over and above special pay off. <laughs> and the risk, the risk reward is usually, um, yeah, it's usually not there. And so you always see people that end up yeah injured because they've overdone it, overcooked by the games. Um, the, the difficulty of course, I would say is, is sometimes the course will necessitate special preparation. So in Tokyo, for instance, we did a lot of heat prep, uh, and then hot jokes on us. It was a typhoon, but, um, for the women's race, (laughs) but here the, the course in Paris, it could be warm, but it's also pretty flat. So, and it will be fast. The swim is very, very specific with the current being really strong. Uh, so, you know, in one direction, you're swimming an average of 55 seconds per hundred meters and the other direction you're swimming like 130. So (laughs) it's, it's very, very, uh, special course. And then, um, and then, yeah, the the run is also pretty flat and fast. So, uh, I think you just, you just need to be able to have, you know, just prepare a little bit, adapt your training sessions in accordance with the demands of the course, which is, Yeah. Be able to swim hard, uh, especially against current, um, and be able to have, keep pedal to the metal, let's say on the bike, because you're, the pressure is always going to be on. There's never a moment where you're not pedaling basically. And the run then be ready for a really fast run off of that bike. There's, there's just so many factors. My mind is, is just spinning, thinking about like training and getting maybe not so much faster in the water, but being super fit in the water so that that strong return trip, I think you do do it twice. I think it's two laps, right? Possibly. Yep. Yep. That's it. So you, you're coming back twice. You don't want that to, to eat into your fitness that's on the bike or on the run. So, you know, someone looking at that would be exactly to your point. Like I need to swim really fast. Like I need to get faster because it's the Olympics and I need to, I need to, you know, do my best, but it's also like, how, how can I do it? So I'm not taxing my body, uh, so much so that I'm actually building resilience and endurance to, or resilience to the fatigue and endurance so that I can get to the bike and and be good. And then it opens up all the factors of it's a flat run. So do you really need to be doing hills? I'm I'm sure Paulo says, yes. Uh, I think he's a fanatic (laughs) for hills, um, (laughs) from what I've, what I've read and, and heard, but, um, but a flat course. So a lot of monotony, a lot of not really changing speeds. You're going to be settling in except for the turnarounds, uh, the the hairpins. So there's so many, so much strategy involved in this. Will you incorporate that stuff into your existing training? Cause this is like your third round now going towards the Olympics. And you, I'm a, I'm assuming, you know, your body really well, you know, what's required and demanded of you, but you also know when overreaching um, is possible. So do you kind of have a feel of how this is going to go? I mean, yeah, in terms of how, how you kind of build the space and how, especially the, this portion here, January, February, March, these are where we put in a lot of hours and it's kind of not, it's, it's relatively low intensity, but somehow it's surprisingly hard. <laughs> and it's not any specific day. It's just the accumulation of, you know, day after day, week after week, month after month, and being able to like string that whole volume of work together. But that really sets your aerobic base for the for the race season. And then we start to add in race specific aspects. And we'll also do um you know, these kind of like skill or crit sessions that will mimic maybe the turns of the courses or the, the key moments, like you say, out of hairpins or whatever. I think, um, the cobbles also kind of play a role. And interestingly enough, not so much on the bike, but on the run, it is extremely unstable and you feel it immediately. I think it's also the carbon shoes with the foam and everything. So you're like Mm. even more unstable and, you know, you, when I would get on the cobbles, I felt like I was about to cramp up and then I would get off the cobbles and be like, Oh, I'm fine. (laughs) So that was an interesting, that was an interesting dynamic. Uh, and so I think like, even, even with my strength coach in the gym, that's something that I also kind of told him, uh, I said, listen, I want to be sure that my calf and my ankles are, uh, strong and resilient. And so it's just kind of like integrating those systematically, 
you know, every week, week after week and building that up. Um, but you know, the other aspect of it, and that's why I think the world series racing, the world series is so important is that that is my best mimic of the games. So racing well there, that is the only place I can get those race dynamics and that level of racing. And that, that's like the most important prep, um, in my opinion, that I can have for, for the games, because that's where the level, that's where the bar is set. <laughs> so, so you're 35 now you turned 35, uh, just in October of last year. How has, how has that informed training? Um, have you noticed any need for, you know, increased recovery or, has being a professional now for, gosh, I guess what going on 10 years and being in your mid thirties, has that informed a shift in training at all for you? That's an interesting question. I think, um, I think what has, I've noticed overall is maybe two things. The first is that as I build back, when I come if I've taken three weeks off, let's say at the end of the season, and then I come back to it, that kind of year after year, the base, like the muscle memory or the base, or I don't know what, but it comes back faster. It's mm-hmm. like, it's like, yeah, girl, we got you. You, you've been there. Like <laughs> you put in the miles. Uh, um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's almost like the body kind of knows a bit better. And also the second thing I would say is that, yeah, learning to read, the signs of like, uh, this is a niggle that will probably go away in 12 hours or whatever versus, uh, this is a niggle of like, I'm just going to back off just to like tomorrow or today. And after one day off, like, I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to reset and be back to, you know, back in business, let's say. And so I think kind of making those subtle adjustments, um, I probably have improved a bit in that. Um, I will say also that Paulo's training has a lot of these ranges. Uh, so the way our coach kind of structures it is that he often gives us, we'll have maybe once or twice a week optional rides or runs, and then the run might be 40 to 50 minutes or, you know, just with ranges. So that also lets you choose based on the fatigue that you're carrying over from one sport to another, which will be different for everybody within the squad. But that allows you also yourself to be like, okay, you know what, today I'm doing the minimum or some, another day you may be like, well, actually I'm feeling fine. I'm absorbing this load really well. And you just feel good. You're in the flow. So you just, you just go. Um, so that is also kind of built into the program. And I think as you get older, that does, that does tend to, you tend to regulate that better, I think. Um, yeah, I would think so. You know, when you're in your twenties, it's like, well, I'm I'm going to go for the, you know, the the max amount like all the time. But as the years get put on, have you found that you're more apt to be like, yeah, it's a 40 minute run today and I'm totally okay with that. <laughs> yeah. I think some of that's also a little bit like personality dependent, you know, mm. some people are always more top of the range and other people are always more middle of the range. I, I, I definitely recognize also that I am more on the perfectionist side of things. So like, I like to do what is written on my like program as it is written. And, um, but yeah, at the same time, there's also like keeping the big picture in mind has become easier and easier. And I think, you know, I kind of 2019 to 2022 were like, a lot of accidents, a lot of injuries also in that time frame. And, you know, I had this, this bike accident that ended up with like a, a big, big knee injury that kind of took 18 months to rehab. I just got back in time for Tokyo, which thank goodness was postponed in a way. Um, not that I would condone a, a global pandemic, but um, it turned out to be, give me extra time to at least be on the start line. And then you know, ended up tearing my calf in the race and this kind of calf tear kept coming back, kept coming back. It didn't seem to matter what I was doing. And I was starting to really lose trust in my body. And those doubts about age really were coming in as well as kind of like, well, Claire, maybe, maybe this is it. Maybe your body just can't cope with these kind of injuries, these kind of, you know, and I just, I was really close to also being like, ah, I'm going to call it quits here. And, um, in the end, uh, you know, 2023 was kind of when I finally was able to turn the page and 
you know, it just came from sort of consistently just kept, kept at it, kept at it until I could finally start to string together. Oh, okay. We've got some consistent weeks here. Okay. Not feeling any niggles. Okay. This is going well. And then suddenly it was like, okay, race after race. Good. Haven't fallen off my bike. Haven't been hit by anything, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and that's kind of when it was like, okay, I just put together a whole season here where I didn't, um, I didn't need to cancel a single plane ticket. All right. Like, <laughs> and that seemed like, that seemed like a big victory to me. I mean, to the point where I, to be quite honest for about three years, I would only book tickets the week of the race because I just did not trust at all that I, I just didn't know. I didn't know what could happen. I was like, anything could happen here. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I just, that's how little trust I had in my body, um, that it was going to keep itself together. And um, yeah, and so it finally was able to turn the page. And that's also what got me really excited here for 2024. But, you know, to kind of tie back to also what we were saying before with this decision to end m my career having this last year is I also realized that there are very few athletes that, can choose on their own terms when they want to end their professional career. Mm. A lot of times people are either stopping for because their body gives out or because their mind gives out. And, you know, I'm really kind of proud of myself, to be honest. I didn't let either of them give out. <laughs> I was like, no, no, we're not done here. Um, and uh, to be able to, to, you know, hopefully – participate in my third games and, and have a strong performance there and also strong performance for the relay team. Uh, but like I say, obviously qualify first, that's the first objective, but, um, yeah. And I think it also reminded me that no, it's, it's not age. It's not just age. You, you also have bonuses from age. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. you do. Yeah. And when you can just slow down enough to recognize those because they're just so inherent, they'll just start rolling into your language and the way that you handle situations in your life. But there is, um, there is such a grace and so much wisdom that comes, you know, as we, as we get older and patience, we learn patience with the body. And, um, yeah, I mean, what a beautiful recognition that you get to choose. You're going out on, on your terms, um, after this season has, um, has the law, I, 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 and as you are wrapping up your professional career, was there ever a time where you thought about going into those longer distances? Maybe in that time where you're kind of questioning things, like maybe I should just switch it up and not be in so much high intensity in my racing? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I remember having a conversation with someone uh, at the end of the season, just a, a friend of mine in the triathlon community in Belgium, and he was like, you know, I know that it sounds counterintuitive, but he's like, I'm telling you with, with, if you go long, like, because the idea for me at that point, I was like, oh man, I can't even put together a 10 K. How would I do a, a half marathon? And, mm -hmm. and then I was thinking, he was like, yeah, but you'll, you know what? Everything's that kind of a more controlled, you don't have those spikes. You're, it's a different style of racing. And I was like, yeah, actually there's probably a lot of validity to that. And I will say that I do have a bit kind of mixed feelings about, um, I do plan to do some 70.3s at the end of this year. Mm. Um, if I end up not qualifying for the Olympics, then I might do that sooner rather than later. Uh, but if I do qualify for the Olympics, then it, that will be my main focus until August. And then I will, uh, want to do a few, but it's more satisfying a curiosity than, being able, I know I cannot, like in the new role that I will be in, um, if I were to continue as a professional triathlete in long distance, I would essentially be my own boss, which is not, which is a huge conflict of interest. So, uh, that's not, that's not possible. Um, but also, I mean, so it made me doubt quite a bit in the beginning. Cause I was like, Oh, I don't, I just don't know. And it's an exciting time also in, that 100K distance with everything that's going on with PTO that just announced their T100 series. And, you know, there's a lot of money going into that as well. And I think it's actually something that would probably suit me quite well, um, especially as, uh, you know, 
a decent swimmer, but not a strong swimmer, I would say. So it's, it's something that I'm definitely curious about and I plan to satisfy that curiosity, but I know that, you know, long-term it's not necessarily something that I can pursue much further. Um, you know, and another aspect to that as well, um, is more with a, a personal life decision. Actually, my husband and I have been doing long distance now for eight years. And since I've been with the squad and we would like to start a, a family and, um, you know, I also want to be clear here that I think that for sure female athletes can come back and be moms and be successful. <laughs> Let me be clear with that. However, yeah. In my particular case, um, you know, my husband also wants to be able to continue doing his job full time. And he's like, listen, if you cannot, if we start a family together, if you're going to be on the road 10 months out of the year, like, I don't think this is sustainable for us. And it's not also realistic to have even financially for us to have like a full time nanny or somebody that travels uh, you know, and I have a lot of respect for the moms that, that are able to come back on the circuit, but it's, it's more the logistic side of things for me that didn't really make sense. And I didn't really see myself also just saying, okay, well I can continue doing long distance and I'll just stay in Belgium and train on my own or maybe with a different coach. Like I think a lot of the joy that I have is from my training squad environment and being in that squad environment. So it's like, for me, it's kind of one or the other, but I, I kind of thought that doing everything didn't really make sense. So, um, yeah, it's just, a, it's a choice in the end that I made. Uh, I plan to satisfy the curiosity, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love that you can have that cover, like open and honest conversation and come to, come to, uh, understand you're both on the same page and that you can, can move forward together into this next chapter mm -hmm. and that it's because it's, those can be challenging and difficult conversations to have, especially when you, your identity is so wrapped up most often in the sport that you love so much, but it can take a different, it can take a different form. Um, at least that's something yeah. I've, I've experienced and it sounds like you're embracing that fully and then, and then have that experience, remove the doubt of what it's like to go do these 70.3s that you're, your buddy over there, Martin, is um, crushing um, <laughs> yes. in such an eloquent way, and uh, and and so that I wanted to ask, like, what does it look like for um, what does it look like for the team relay right now? Would would it most likely be Martin and Yelly and you, and um, I don't even know who the next person would be. So um, right now, Yella Keynes has hit the automatic qualification okay. standards. So he, Yella will be, um, is qualified for Paris. Um, next in line would probably be Martin. Uh, he hasn't hit the automatic standard yet, but that's also, he kind of went through a, um, you know, his fair share of injuries as well. And, um, so yeah, I think it's it just if he can kind of prove form or hit a top eight as well in one of the World Series here at the start of the year, then he will also um, move towards his qualification. Um, as for on the women's side, we have Valerie Bartholomew and Yolene Vermeulen are the two women. Um, so Valerie, who was who went to Tokyo as well and had a top ten finish there, um, she's now living in Boulder, Colorado. So. Uh, yeah, she both her and Yoli need to be going also for those those top eights, and if not, it's going to come down to discretionary decision. Um, since so, as I was saying, our our criteria is top twelve at the grand final or top eight at a World Series, and you have to do that twice. So yeah, either two top eights or a top twelve and a top eight. Um, so right now, I'm just like slightly in a more favorable position since I've at least done one of the two. Uh, but yeah, if somebody else does one, then we're back on even footing. So it's kind of the three of us fighting for these, these what will likely be two spots. Um, and we'll have to see in May, ultimately, <laughs> how things shake out, who's able to hit the top eights. And um, But I mean, to be honest, I think that a, a combination of kind of any of us can be, can be, I consider ourselves a dark horse for the relay, to be honest. <laughs> I believe oh, yeah. we got a shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I believe yeah. we have a shot. Um, yeah. And I mean, I, I was super proud of our fifth place in, in Tokyo. Um, 
you know, especially given the circumstances, like, you know, Yella had to miss the mm-hmm. individual race because he had COVID and he made it back just in time for the individual race. And, you know, I, I had torn my calf in the individual race, but we didn't have a reserve at that time. And they still voted to put me first, which was an incredible show of support from them. But also I cannot express to you how nervous I was <laughs> on that start line. Um, but, you know, and and I just feel like we, okay, we didn't bring home a medal, but like, I thought that was still a really, really cool performance. And, and more than anything else, just the resilience of the team and the, the, the support that we showed each other is something like just, yeah. I mean, long after results are forgotten about, those are the moments that I'll remember a lot in in my career. I think the, the support from the other athletes, the, yeah, those, those moments where you really just rise to the occasion, like those are super cool. Those are super cool memories. When, yeah. And, and something, uh, yeah, the, something to like, really look back on and say like, yeah, I, I did this. Like I am capable of this and I'm capable of, of so much more, so much more than this, but this just points you in the direction when you were nervous on that, like you're the first one starting, you have all the nerves are coming in. Um, you're injured. So you, you have, you already kind of like beaten down just a little bit. Like how do you pull yourself into performing? Like how do you beam yourself like right there and, or yeah. Well, how do you do that? How did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, y- you know, like, oh, that's a, that's a difficult question. I think there were like two or three people that said pretty important things to me that were people that came from people that I trust. And the first was, you know, so uh, you have to picture the individual race was like four days before uh, Yella was about to arrive, but he wasn't there yet. So, you know, it was like, are we, the big question of, are we going to even have a team? Our spare guy, uh, Noah Servé had arrived, um, to the training camp in Mito outside of Tokyo, but his bike hadn't arrived. So the poor guy was like, <laughs> you know, we just, on the reserve front, we were, we were kind of struggling. So we were just really unsure about whether or not we were going to be able to align a team, I was struggling to walk and I was thinking, oh my gosh, like what, like how are we, you know, obviously I didn't run in those days and before, in between, but, um, we had a, we had a meeting, uh, with the technical director, the national coach who kind of is the, in charge of both sides, let's say, um, and the four athletes and the physio. And the physio gave the idea, why don't we write down the order that you think the mixed team relay should go in? So who you put first, second, third, fourth, fifth, or fourth, fourth. <laughs> there's no fifth. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, because the thinking was if Claire's calf completely goes and we're out of the race, then we're out of the race. And all the other athletes voted to put me first. And they voted to put me first because they were like, this was our plan to our best plan and what we had rehearsed in other races and our best shot of a medal. So it was also like kind of the best way to maximize people's strengths. Cause for example, Valerie, the other woman, if she is a strong swimmer, so she does better swimming on her own, not in a pack where when you go first, you know, you're swimming 300 meters, the first buoys in hundred meters. If you're not <laughs> used to being in the mess, it's, uh, yeah, it's difficult. And, um, the thinking we all put Yella second and we put Martin last because Martin's a bit better of like a, on a TT level, let's say as a, and essentially, uh, so all the athletes voted for that. And in the end, the national coaches switched Yella and Martin because they thought that I was probably going to mess it up. And Martin was the best chance of bringing us back. And it didn't really matter to me what the, what they decided, but more than anything was the vote of confidence from the athletes that gave me a ton of strength to be like, okay, you know what? Like we just, we're, we're going for this. We're going for this. And that was already the first shift in mindset that was kind of like, um, pretty important for me. And the second thing was, I remember the day before being out with a physio and we were going to try running 
And I had asked uh, my coach Paulo to come and he could tell that I was on the edge of tears. He was like, you know, we're doing these like kind of drills and strides and he's like, okay, just, just try to do a stride. And I could just feel it seizing up. And I was like, okay, like, (laughs) how is this going to go tomorrow? And, um, he just took me aside from the doctors, from the physios, from this team Belgium staff. You know, there's a lot of kind of, there's a lot of staff, let's say at an Olympic games, there's a lot of people and a lot of eyes on you. And he just said to me, like, listen, Claire, this is a, this is a unique occasion. And he's like, this is not something that we would normally do under normal circumstances, but this is the situation that we're in. And, you know, this is going to require some courage on your behalf. And courage doesn't mean that you're not afraid. It just means that you accept the fear and you just (laughs) accept it for what it is, an emotion like anything else, you know? And I was just like, okay, okay, Claire, like you can be afraid. You're allowed to be afraid. It's okay. You just do your best out of the situation. Like just make the best out of the situation with whatever you have. And it was clear from two things, the way that my coach approached it, but also the way that my teammates um, showed support for me and trust in me that I therefore was able to kind of trust myself and, and just let go and just be like, you just, <laughs> it is what it is. And, and I think the the fear also came from, you know, like I said, for context, I was coming out of an 18 month rehab program for my knee. I was fed up with rehab. I was like, <laughs> I do not want to tear this calf all the way open and be, <laughs> you know, like, I'm just really afraid for my, for my long-term health as well. Um, and, and that is, Unfortunately, I think sometimes the dark side also of professional sports is I think we all saw like, I don't know how the heck Lucy Charles Barkley Mm -hmm. (laughs) got through Kona uh, the way she did because, I mean, I I just had a a 10 centimeter tear. I didn't have what, which is, I mean, for me, that was significant enough. um, And I had to kind of walk, jog through the last 5K of a, of a 10K in the individual race. That's completely different than finishing a marathon without skipping a beat. So, <laughs> um, you know, but, but all of that to say that sometimes it's not, it's not healthy, but, um, and it's not something that I would necessarily recommend or condone. It's just the situation was as it was. And, and fear is an emotion like joy is an emotion. It comes and it goes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, and you have a choice to make in that unique situation. And back to what you were talking about with each athlete that you're going to be working with, it's, they're all ne- unique people. So you got to take it one by one. And this experience was just one moment in time. It doesn't mean every time you get to the Olympics and you have a calf tear, like this is going to happen. It's just in that moment, you beam yourself mm-hmm. there. This is it. This is what we have to show up for today. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. And I don't know how Lucy did that cap, that thing. I, it's, it's equated to, I guess a calf injury is like a zipper, right? When you, yeah, like the zipper can come down and it can Easy. come way down, way down. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so pretty intense, but amazing, amazing, um, support system, right? It just shows you at how much weight is given and how it can inf- influence you to have this community, to have your back. Mm. Um, and you're going to be leading the community in your next role, which I think is, is so <laughs> cool. Um, I know we got to we got to wrap this up here. I want to I want to hear um, what what would it feel like? What would it feel like to get that qualification for Paris? Like go to that moment. Uh, let's say Abu Dhabi, and you get your you get your uh, top eight. Eight. <laughs> um. Yeah. You know, usually to be completely honest, the qualification a lot of times is relief. Um, but it's also, I think, uh, each Olympic games has been kind of a different journey in and of itself, you know? And so when I compare Rio qualification to Tokyo qualification to Paris qualification, it's like each time I'm a different athlete, you know, and there's kind of that I don't know. My mental coach always says this. He's like, um, I don't know who says this quote, but it's like, you never step in the same river twice. 
mm-hmm. something like that, you, you know, and it's kind of the idea that either you've changed, the river has changed, you know, and so the appreciation that you have for um, the journey that it takes and, and I think more than anything, I will be proud that I didn't give up on myself, I think, mm-hmm. for for Paris. I think that's the that's the biggest, that will be the biggest takeaway for me. And, um, you know, unfortunately (laughs) my Olympic, uh, performances have been, um, lackluster, let's say. Uh, and so they've, it just, it just leaves me motivated, you know, to just, just go and give, give the best of myself. And, um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, like that's, that's all you can, that's all you can really ask for, I think. So, um, yeah, to be able to qualify for Paris and then to perform to the best of my ability, injury free, um, you know, and then the, the chips will fall where the chips will fall, you know, but, but if I can just leave those races thinking, you know what, I gave everything I, I could have there. Um, I think that'll be pretty satisfying. Ah, beautiful. I love it. And Paris is a brand new river. So there you go. Right. As you, as you step into it, anything, hopefully a clean one. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, literally, like literally, hopefully it's clean. Um, so I also saw that you are, and actually just signed up for it this morning, that you're doing a monthly newsletter about your journey to Paris. Um, so how can people get, um, get their name on that newsletter so they can stay in touch with you and, and be a part of your journey. And also where are you most active where they can follow you? Yeah. So thank you for subscribing to the newsletter. That's, um, people can follow me on Instagram. It's Claire Michelle tree, try (laughs) T R I. Um, (laughs) uh, and, uh, I'm also on Facebook, but a little bit less active, let's say. Um, and then, on my Instagram, there's a link in, in my bio to sign up for the newsletter. Um, and so it's currently offered in English and in French. So you can sign up for whatever version you want. And that comes out the first Monday of, uh, every month. And, um, yeah, this is something I did in the lead up to Tokyo as well. And I just thought I would bring it back kind of, um, yeah. Also, you know, every month there is a, a contest It's kind of designed to challenge people to also push their own boundaries. Cause I don't, I don't think the level of sport matters. I think you can, from a total beginner to a very advanced, uh, the challenge that you get from sport and like the way you push your boundaries is kind of exactly the same. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the, the point that I, the reason, I guess, that I, I decided to start this newsletter again and also to shed a bit more insight. Uh, we will, the February edition, of course, we'll talk about a lot of stuff that we just talked about here also um, with why I decided to put an end to my career at the end of this year. And um, so, yeah, if people want to follow along, each month will be something different. Awesome. Fabulous. And um, they can subscribe to those um, World Triathlon Series races on what? Triathlon Live, right? And it's super affordable and they're really exciting races. They're great to watch when you're on the trainer. And you can watch them over and over. And over and over if you're BJ, you can watch them <laughs> over and over and over and over again. Um, and they've got all the they've got the Olympics on there too, don't mm-hmm. they? Yeah, they've got the Olympics and mm-hmm. all so. that good Not stuff. YouTube does. Yeah. Um, all right, awesome, Claire. Thank you so much. It was great to see you. Thank and, you. Uh, great to talk to yeah. you again. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much for the chat. I appreciate it. 